and the day that the trial began that if I would have taken a plea, I would have avoided the death penalty. While the person who actually committed the crime got a life sentence. That's just, no, that's not right. That's foolish because I wasn't gonna, I didn't accept the plea because I wasn't gonna sign my life away for something I didn't do. I'm actually one of those people. I am sitting on death row for nothing more than a series of lies. In February 2009, Heather Strong was kidnapped and slaughtered in Marion County, Florida. Her slayer, Amelia Lily Carr, was found guilty in December 2010 and sentenced to her end by lethal injection in February 2011. Who was Amelia Carr and why did she commit this heinous act? Amelia Carr's life. Emilia Carr was born Emilia Yera, the second of three sisters. A psychologist estimated her IQ to be 125. At the age of 15, she reported misuse by her father to her school, but withdrew her statement to officials. In February 2004, Carr's father was convicted of attempting to solicit the slayings of his family and was sentenced to four years in prison. Carr had been married twice and filed a restraining order against one of her ex-husbands for domestic violence. She was sentenced to two years of probation for her involvement in her ex-husband's grand theft of exotic birds. Carr had three children at the time, one of them with ex-boyfriend Jamie Acomb. In November 2008, Carr became engaged to Joshua Damien Fulham, who instead married Heather Strong one month later. However, Carr maintained contact with him and babysat Strong's two children, according to Carr's family. In January 2009, Fulham was arrested for threatening Strong with a shotgun but was released after the charge of aggravated charge with a firearm was dropped. Investigators later discovered that Carr had threatened Strong with a knife to force her to withdraw her criminal complaint. Carr and Fulham re-established their relationship while Strong began seeing someone else. Fulham and Strong became involved in a legal battle over the custody of their two children. The story behind the crime. In February 2009, Heather Strong, then a 26-year-old resident of Citra, Florida, disappeared while employed at an iron skillet restaurant at a Petro gas station next to Interstate Route 75 in Reddick. She was reported missing on February 15. Her remains were discovered on March 19 in a shallow grave by a storage trailer in Boardman near McIntosh, Florida. Carr was arrested after investigators noted the frequency of her statements to authorities, 10 in all without the presence of an attorney. Detectives also recorded undercover audio of Carr discussing details of the crime with Fulham's sister. Carr, who at the time was seven months pregnant with Fulham's child, tricked Strong into the storage trailer behind the home of Carr's mother, Maria, and placed a plastic bag over her head after unsuccessfully trying to break her neck. Strong eventually perished of asphyxiation while bound by duct tape to a computer chair. Strong's estranged husband, Joshua Fulham, was arrested on suspicion of fraud for using her credit cards after she had disappeared. Carr wasn't arrested in the case until March 24, 2009, managing to elude arrest for almost a week as she negotiated and engaged in verbal gymnastics with sheriff's detectives Donald Buey and Brian Spivey, seeking to distance herself from the gruesome crime. Although Strong and Fulham were longtime friends, they had two children together but married as recently as December 2009. It was Fulham and Carr who were romantically involved at the time of Heather's death. In fact, Carr was seven months pregnant with Fulham's child at the time. Whatever their commitment to one another, King told jurors that Carr had told detectives it was Fulham who allegedly threatened to do the same to her that he said he had done to his estranged wife, strangle her, then bury her body. Later, after Strong's body was unearthed, said the prosecutor, Carr requested a private meeting with Fulham's sister in which she revealed the manner in which Strong was slain, suffocated with a bag over her head after Carr tried and failed to break her neck. That conversation, unbeknownst to Carr, was recorded by law enforcement. In a sign that this trial could hinge on jurors' interpretation of Carr's videotaped confessions, her defense attorney cautioned the jury in her opening statement to be mindful of Carr's stress levels when she provided her statements. Saying Carr was as much of a victim as Heather, Candace Hawthorne reminded the jury that Carr was undergoing a high-risk pregnancy when questioned and that her three other children had recently been removed from her custody. Are they out there to do justice or are they out there to win? And in Amelia's case, they were out to win. Law enforcement is very crafty and they're out there to win. She believed that her love and her heart and her honesty would bear out. Because of her emotional state and physical state, being pregnant 
the hormones. They play all sorts of tricks on your head. She was an innocent that was manipulated by law enforcement into giving a false confession. Tossing the blame and intent back onto Fulham, who remains in custody at the jail as he awaits his own trial on the same charges. Hawthorne cast him as a jealous and possessive man who wanted strong, who was tied to other men, all to himself. We had a lot of similar passions. She wanted to be a teacher. You know, I became a massage therapist. Just me and Heather had a lot of similarities in our past. Um, because at the end of the day, there was no animosity. We would hang out, just girl talk. We both had that maternal love, and we both always tried to do what was best for our kids. Later in March 2009, Carr gave birth to her fourth child while in custody at Marion County Jail. All of her children were placed in foster care. Carr provided a confession to investigators but claimed that she had only done so in the hope of being reunited with her children. Uh, they befriend you, they just want to clear this up, they want to clear your name, and nothing can be further from the truth. The police are not on your side, and they are trained in interrogation techniques. She was very conniving. She was very good at manipulating people. She's, I think, truly what you would call a sociopath. Trials of Emilia Carr and Joshua Fulham. Emilia Carr and Joshua Fulham waived their right to a speedy trial during their arraignment for slaying in April 2009. Prosecutor Rock Hooker immediately filed a notice of his intent to pursue the death penalty because of the heinous nature of the crime. There was no physical evidence linking her to the crime, but in this case, none may have been necessary. In a conversation captured clearly on tape, Emilia Carr confesses to assisting with the brutal crime. An hour-long tape was played back for jurors during Carr's first-degree slaying and kidnapping trial. It was one of many recorded conversations prosecutors played for the panel, and this one was thought to be the most convincing one of all. At the time of the conversation, the women were sitting beside each other in a car, yeah, she fought him, Carr responded. Did you help? Gustafson continued. Yeah, I helped, Carr said softly. The echoes of Carr's vivid and confessionary words to Gustafson, a friend of hers, seemed to linger in the courtroom and were likely one of the most damaging pieces of evidence against her. In November 2009, State Circuit Judge Willard Pope declined Emilia Carr's request for a continuance of the trial because of her concerns over the preparedness of defense attorney Candace Hawthorne. A jury found Carr guilty of first-degree slaying and kidnapping after two and a half hours of deliberations on December 7, 2010. During the penalty phase of the trial, Carr's family testified on her behalf that she had been traumatized since her early childhood by physical exploitation by her father and grandfather. However, the jury voted 7-5 to five on December 10 in favor of the fatal penalty for Carr. She was formally sentenced to her end by lethal injection on February 22, 2011. More than a year after Carr's conviction for the slaying of Heather Strong, her co-defendant, Joshua Fulham, went on trial for his alleged participation in the slaying in April 2012. Carr, on the row at the Lowell Correctional Institute Annex, would not testify at the trial. The prosecution detailed the gruesome aspects of the crime. Both the prosecution and Fulham's defense attorneys agreed that the motives for Heather Strong's slaying were jealousy and betrayal. At the conclusion of his trial, Fulham was convicted of first-degree slaying and kidnapping. Despite the fatal sentence of his co-defendant, Joshua's jury voted 8-4 to four to sentence him to life in prison without parole, and the judge followed the jury's recommendation. Carr was placed in the annex at Lowell Correctional Institution in Marion County on February 23, 2011. She was one of four women on the row in Florida, the other three being Tiffany Cole, Margaret Allen, and Anna Marie Cardona. I was shaking so bad. The duct tape, the asphyxiation. What do you feel? Mm -hmm. Life row? Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're not dying, we're living. Do you ever think I might be executed? No. You can't have that mentality. Do you call it death row? No, we call it life row. That means you've accepted you've already this. Di you've already died. Yeah, you You're cannot already have that mentality. Carr also became the first woman to be sentenced to her end in Marion County since the 1992 sentencing of Eileen Wernos. Resentencing. Once the youngest woman sentenced to such a serious punishment, Carr's fate would change after an evidentiary hearing on May 19, 2017, in which the state declined to seek a new fatal penalty phase, according to court records, and 5th Judicial Circuit Court Judge Willard Pope 
resentenced Carr, 32 years old at the time, to life in prison without parole. She had been fighting her sentence since 2011. As we said, in her trial, the jury voted 7-5 to five to recommend the capital punishment for Carr. Carr appealed her sentence, raising several issues, including possible errors by the trial judge and the proportionality of the fatal sentence. In 2015, the Florida Supreme Court affirmed Carr's fatal sentence. The High Court wrote the following in its decision. This case involves a love triangle between the victim, Heather Strong, her estranged husband, Joshua Fulham, and the defendant, Amelia Carr, that ended when Carr and Fulham carried out their plan to slaughter Strong. Carr restarted the appeal process, claiming ineffective assistance from her lawyer. And the day that the trial began, that if I would have taken a plea, I would have avoided the death penalty. Yes. I was told prior to trial, that's just, no, that's not right. That's foolish. Because I wasn't going to, I didn't accept the plea because I wasn't going to sign my life away for something I didn't do. It was during an evidentiary hearing on this appeal that her fate changed. Carr's resentencing came at a pivotal time for Florida's fatal penalty. After being ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in January 2016, Florida's capital punishment scheme became a topic of debate and revision. The Florida Supreme Court released an opinion in October 2016 calling for a unanimous jury. In March 2017, Governor Rick Scott signed new rules requiring a unanimous jury decision for the fatal sentence. The Florida Supreme Court was still hammering out final jury instructions for the new fatal sentence scheme when Carr appealed her sentence. Everyone in prison will tell you they're innocent. They were framed or they had a confession beat out of them by law enforcement. Either they were at the wrong place at the wrong time, while the person who actually committed the crime got a life sentence. I'm actually one of those people. I am sitting on death row for nothing more than a series of lies. That's all for today's video. See you next time.